The reason you can sit here in relative safety and relative prosperity and freedom and say whatever you want didn't just grow on a tree. I guess the central idea of the West, from my perspective, is this idea of liberal democracy and underlying that these principles of free individual choice, religious liberty, economic freedom, constitutionalism, rule of law, and I would add scientific rationality. And those are not things that are natural to humankind. Those are historical anomalies. And so it's something that needs to be regarded as very precious and protected and conserved very carefully. What we've been doing, I would argue, in the West for the last 30 years is being teaching people of my generation to, regard, to, to view it through the lens of the deepest possible hostility. And those people don't just take on that sentiment and then live ordinary lives. They, 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 there's an element of practice. They, 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 they apply that hostility. They apply that sense that the West's power structures need to, need to be dismantled. C capitalism needs to be dismantled. Uh, the scientific method needs to be dismantled. The mathematics <laughs> needs to be dismantled because it's the product of straight white men. All that sort of guff. It's, it, it fans out into the wider culture and it, and it, and it corrupts um, our societies. The West is under attack. We live in the freest, healthiest and wealthiest societies in human history. Yet as authoritarian and oppressive regimes threaten us from without, a new movement within tells us to feel nothing but shame for who we are. Rembrandt's The Night Watch reminds us of other possibilities. This vast and still astonishing masterpiece, depicting a local Amsterdam militia at the height of the Dutch Golden Age, articulates confidence in Western culture. One of these guys that I interviewed, who, was, who had been a, a platoon commander, he'd been in Afghanistan, um, especially in, in Africa, um, and his view as a former soldier was when he looks at that that painting he sees a society that absolutely under, understands itself and is, you know, has some degree of pride in itself from top to bottom it comes down to the even to the gestures and the poses of the people in it um and it, it's true it's, it's very hard to know what our equivalent to the night watch might look like who would be defending who and why and could they all agree and wouldn't some of them be racist and some of them be you know it's it's like do we all get along no there are these huge kind of factions and stuff and, and at the end of the day yeah I, th I think increasingly few people can answer the question of what they would be defending welcome to the west this is my take on the great and still unfolding adventure of who we are and why it matters this is a history of how our extraordinary unconventional civilization came to be and why it must be defended. It's a fascinating and often unexpected journey, stretching back 15 centuries to the fall of Rome. The first Westerners were barbarians, but the barbarian West would have been nothing without the faith that transformed it. The new culture that emerged came to limit the power even of kings. Now our epic journey continues into a world of strange inventions. The innovative culture of the West eventually produced not just new gadgets, but a whole new way to understand the world. Science. Many people associate the West with the rise of the modern sciences. And I think that's a fair assu assumption in the sense that the most radical and lasting developments in what we call the sciences today have happened in the West, and they have generally transformed the world for the better. But our story starts here, in London's Borough Market. In some ways, apart from the price, buying a bag of lentils hasn't changed much in centuries. But in so many ways, science and technology has changed almost everything else. Later, we'll see how the humble lentil had a central role to play in bringing that about. But so too did the markets themselves. 
The West's barbarian origins gave it a warlike character. But as the West developed, we also learned to channel that energy into a far more productive kind of battle. The battle of commerce. And you can see that in our art. The Arnolfini marriage, painted in 1434 one of the West's greatest and most famous paintings. And remarkably, it's not of a nobleman, but a merchant and his wife. Leonardo da Vinci's unsurpassed portrait, Mona Lisa, painted in the early 1500s of Lisa Gerandini, the wife of a woolen silk merchant. And of course, Rembrandt's Night Watch, painted in 1642. The man in yellow, came from a family of spice merchants. The leader was the son of a pharmacist, and his wife's father founded the Dutch East India Company. These splendid paintings capture the confidence and wealth of a society open to commerce. That was a break with classical and aristocratic ideals that said elites shouldn't get their hands dirty or meddle with trade. In the West, trade and invention have gone together as its competitive spirit inspired and disseminated new tools and ideas. That also shifted what got invented, from what would please an emperor to things that mattered to ordinary people. And finally, in a shift that would transform our understanding of everything, including ourselves, the West's questioning spirit produced modern science. Well, the story of how that happened is fascinating, and lentils have a key role to play. In 1727, a grand funeral was held here to honour a new kind of Western hero, Isaac Newton, the greatest genius of the new scientific age. President of the Royal Society from 1703, Newton came from a humble family in Lincolnshire, but his brilliance as a mathematician and natural philosopher was unparalleled, producing contributions that include the formulation of the three universal laws of motion and discovery of the law of gravity, as well as the invention of the reflecting telescope. He was buried in honour in Westminster Abbey, his coffin carried by earls and dukes. The French philosopher Voltaire marvelled that the son of an illiterate farmer could be buried with the honours once reserved for a king. The West scientific revolution took place late in its history, in the 16th and 17th centuries, but it built on a long history of Western technological innovation. The West we know emerged from the fall of Rome. The end of Rome's empire in Western Europe brought real losses. In Britain, the potter's wheel vanished for centuries. But while the early West was primitive, it was also inventive from the beginning. With no more armies of slaves, labour-saving innovations were quickly developed to serve the ordinary needs of the new society. The heavy plough, which transformed the landscape and agricultural productivity of northwestern Europe, emerged rapidly and was adopted widely in the New West. Other inventions followed in a steady stream, in some cases literally. Water mills had been known in ancient Rome, but now they were improved and installed across the West, providing mechanised labour well before the Industrial Revolution. In England, the Doomsday Book records 6,000 mills, almost all in existence from the 11th century, the earliest mills here dated from the middle of the 8th century. The West had no monopoly on inventiveness. Indeed, its small size and relatively primitive culture compared to the scale and grandeur and long-term stability of civilizations elsewhere meant that many important discoveries had already been made. Trade routes helped introduce these to the West, and we developed a knack for taking good ideas wherever we found them and making them our own. Our alphabet is Phoenician by way of the Greeks and Romans. Our modern numerals replacing the more limited Roman system are Indian by way of the Islamic world.
Indeed, much of our knowledge of ancient Greek culture, including its scientific thought, came via the same route. This was acknowledged even at the time. Key Muslim thinkers gained westernized names, including Avicenna, Alhazen, and Averroes. Averroes even makes an appearance in Raphael's great philosophical fresco for the Vatican's Apostolic Palace, the School of Athens. Here he is, peering over the shoulder of Pythagoras. And it's significant that the School of Athens is located in the Pope's official residence, at the very heart of Roman Catholic power and self-understanding. God, in the biblical account, creates the world through his word, through his reason. God imprints a kind of divine logic into the created world. Think about the two most uh, powerful scientific developments of the last several hundred years. Um, the extraordinary development of genetics, the tracking of the human genome, the identification of the human genome, with all that comes out of that and the Big Bang Theory of the origins of the universe. Both of those ideas, genetics and the, and, and the mainstream of modern cosmology, begin with Catholic priests. Other inventions, notably paper and gunpowder, came from China. But something strange happened to all these ideas in the West that hadn't happened before. They were seized on, improved and widely shared. Paper had been made by hand and foot for a thousand years in China and the Islamic world. As an invention, it had to travel across vast distances before it reached the West in the 13th century. In all that time, little had changed. But as soon as paper arrived in the West, its manufacture was mechanized with the help of the West's increasingly sophisticated water mills. But the West did far more than adopt and improve upon ideas from without. Two of its most astonishing inventions helped lay the foundation for even greater achievements that were to follow. The first was something that seems to us too every day to notice, the mechanical clock. Now, water clocks had been in use long before. In China, one imperial water clock had been brought to an extraordinary level of sophistication. But it proved a dead end. In the West, however, it wasn't the emperor, but ordinary users who were pressing for the reliability and precision of mechanical clocks. And in a sign of the West's difference, as soon as these new clocks were invented, they spread like wildfire and got better and better. We don't know exactly when that clockwork revolution began, but the initial breakthrough was made around the 1270s, probably either in England or Italy. Given the West's wide-ranging innovation culture, there are contenders around the same time in Spain and France as well. It, it arises from the bottom-up character of Western civilization, where people have initiative that they take, they, they set out to do things without getting permission from anybody. They just go and do it. And, and that, tend to, that tendency to initiate, to change things without permission, is a thing that generates the constant improvement, also the turmoil and the uncertainty. The dynamism is between uh, the, what is eternal in humankind and what is always new and, and fresh in the moment. Uh, we live in time, and that is a, a remarkable thing because I don't think that God lives in time. I think we live in time, and that makes us uh, have a different, we are having a different experience than uh, eternity. Clocks changed how everyone worked in the West. But they also changed how they saw the world and heaven itself. By 1320, the great poet Dante was using the regularity and intricacy of the new clock to describe paradise itself. He wrote, just as in a clock's machinery to one who watches them, the wheels turn so that while the first wheel seems to rest, the last wheel flies. And soon the clocks themselves weren't just timekeepers, but models of God's universe. We think today of the clockwork universe as a demystified place, running by scientific laws and so emptied of spiritual meaning. But throughout the 14th century, 
glorious mechanical wheels turn to reveal and celebrate the regularity of God's created order. This model had important mistakes. The earth stood at its centre, with the sun going round. But the clocks standing in every public square also conveyed powerful truths. They said that God's world was rational and ordered, that it revealed its secrets to careful investigators, and it was proper to use that knowledge to create new things. And for about the next 300 years, these amazing machines, with their radical vision of the nature of reality, were a Western monopoly. Other civilizations either couldn't make them, or couldn't generate the widespread demand that drove adoption in the West. Which brings us back to lentils. Here they are, perhaps the most important invention of the Middle Ages, made around the 1280s, less than 10 years after the mechanical clock. Glass lenses for spectacles. Lenses got their name from their resemblance to the curved shape of the humble lentil. And on the 23rd of February 1306, a popular Italian preacher, Fra Jordan of Rivalto, gave a sermon in which he mentioned for the very first time the new art of making eyeglasses, saying it had been discovered 20 years earlier. And according to the Chronicle of Jordan's Monastery, the original inventor had been unwilling to share his discovery, but a monk who was clever with his hands had worked out how to replicate the amazing design. Just like the clocks, eyeglasses were soon everywhere, thanks to widespread demand and a commercial system that was eager to supply the new miracle product. The glassmakers from Venice were especially quick off the mark, and by 1384 already about 400 pairs of spectacles every month were being imported just to London from the continent. And that's because glasses really were like magic, a cure for the near universal disease of middle-aged short-sightedness. So they hugely extended the working life of everyone over the age of 40 for anything involving fine detail. And best of all, they made intensive reading possible well into old age, and that had huge knock-on effects. The Renaissance depended on scholars poring over ancient documents in monasteries, to discover forgotten classical manuscripts. And in the next century, by the time Gutenberg mechanized printing and made mass production of books possible, a mass audience of older readers had already been created by this elegant invention. But it is clear that Western culture has an abstract character where the things we believe are real are not simply those that we see or sense in our sense impressions. We imagine that in the background is some general truth or abstraction that is more true than what we see in the moment. And, and that is a, a fundamental uh, aspect of Western culture, particularly in the connection with science. Science and the academic world is all about discovering the general truths that lie behind the facts of the moment. And that is one of the reasons why science and technology have been so powerful in the West and also distrusted by the rest of the world because in the rest of the world, the fear is that the search for these general truths has gone undermined the orthodoxies of religion and culture in other respects. Both mechanical clocks and spectacles seem to have been the product of artisan tinkering, but there were limits to what that approach could achieve. Everywhere in history where periods of technological innovation have occurred, they then quickly petered out, and that was true in the West as well. What was needed was a way to combine the theoretical thinking that was happening in universities with the practical work of the artisans. We needed experimental science. And luckily, with the aid of clocks and spectacles, the conditions in the West were becoming ripe. Spectacles helped to open up new intellectual frontiers and bring about the Renaissance. Clocks gave us a model of a rational and predictable creation. Put that together, and something astonishing began to emerge. That sense of a rational world waiting to be understood helped truly scientific thinking to emerge in the West. It was supported by the development of a new science of law in the 12th century and the legal independence of universities. And as the Italian Renaissance began, the legal order continued to be a key contributor in other ways too. 
The invention of spectacles might have been lost if a clever monk hadn't copied the design, because their creator tried to keep his invention secret. It was the only way at the time to protect intellectual property. Better law could solve that, and it was a Renaissance invention. The creator of this magnificent dome here in Florence, Filippo Brunelleschi, was also the inventor of a special kind of barge, a boat to transport marble. We know that because in 1421, he received the world's first ever patent for it, a three-year monopoly, so that he may be animated more fervently to even higher pursuits and stimulated to more subtle investigations. Now, in the end, his boat, Il Badalone, sank on its maiden voyage, but the idea of patents had more staying power. In 1474, Venice brought in the first patent statute, allowing inventors of any new and ingenious device a 10-year monopoly. The West's competitive nature was at it again. Venice was trying to pull in individuals who had the most clever minds, capable of devising and inventing all kinds of contrivances. The West already had a remarkably large number of questioning minds, just as it does today. That's not how we often think of the medieval intellect, with its deep religious faith. But theology was also a questioning discipline, powered by the radically unsettling nature of the Christian message. In the 11th century, Pope Gregory VII wrote in his letters that any custom, no matter how venerable, must yield utterly to truth. Well, the West believes in those, in those general truths, and that goes right back to Greek philosophy. This is what Plato asserted. Uh, and ever since then, we've believed in abstractions. And the abstractions also motivate change because we have principled ideals of the way things ought to be. And we see that the rest of the current world isn't realizing those norms, so we pursue change to make it realize those values. And that's one reason for the permanent, for the, the uh, emphasis on change and improvement in the West. Still, it took time before observations of the real world were used to challenge the medieval model of the clockwork heavens. Then, in 1572, an astronomer called Tycho Brahe saw something in the heavens that the old theories had no explanation for at all. A new star, a supernova. Observation with the naked eye could only take astronomers so far, but the glass lenses that had created spectacles turned out to be even more powerful than they already seemed. An optician in the Netherlands, Hans Lippehey, realized that you could put two lenses in a tube and use them to magnify distant objects. He applied for a patent in 1608, although it was turned down, and the microscope also seems to have been invented about the same time. In Italy, Galileo Galilei soon got his hands on this Dutch spyglass, and he made it from little more than a crude toy into a scientific instrument. Some preferred not to look at what Galileo's telescope revealed, but the challenge to traditional knowledge was growing. In 1620, Sir Francis Bacon proposed a new and more scientific way to arrive at knowledge by reasoning from careful observation. Bacon once wrote that if a man could succeed, not in striking out some particular invention, however useful, but in kindling a light in nature, which should bring into sight all that is most hidden and secret in the world, that man would be the propagator of man's empire over the universe. That idea proved hugely influential. In 1660 in London, the Royal Society was formed, partly inspired by their Baconian programme, to improve natural knowledge. The science that was forming was humble and questioning. It wasn't necessarily irreligious. The 16th century astronomer Johann Kepler spoke for many when he said his work was an attempt to think God's thoughts after him. But science took nothing for granted. The motto of the Royal Society was nullius in verba. Take no one's word for it. Uh, I mean, my favorite example is the Wright brothers who invented the airplane in 1903. These guys were bicycle mechanics from Ohio. They had no background, they had no money. And yet, in about three years, they managed to invent the airplane. <laughs> and that changed American life. And that happens all the time.
There are initiatives that occur on the part of individuals, and, and, we, and the rest of us accept that. See, whereas in the non-Western world, there's a lot less acceptance of change because the focus is much more on stability and deference to authority and maintenance of the old values rather than anything new. So the West, by the nature of its society, has driven change in much of the world. And there was something else. From Galileo's refinement of the telescope, the new science combined careful scholarship with the technical ingenuity of skilled artisans. It was the ability of one to inform the other that gave science and technology an unstoppable momentum in the West. Researchers at the Cavendish Laboratory, which was founded here in Cambridge in 1874, have so far won more than 30 Nobel Prizes, including for the discovery of the electron and the neutron. And that's partly because it has always had a very special and practical culture with a passion for creating new scientific instruments. Cavendish scientists, it was said, kept their brains in their fingertips. But science wasn't just about abstract knowledge and machinery. It was also about what made us tick. And Western medical science, from antibiotics to anti-malarials, vaccines to organ transplants, has made all our lives longer and healthier than ever before. In this pub, on February the 28th, 1953, two Cavendish scientists, James Watson and Francis Crick, announced that they had discovered the secret of life. And it wasn't an exaggeration. Building on the brilliant work of Rosalind Franklin at King's College London, where she had used X-ray diffraction to study DNA's shape and density, Watson and Crick had untangled the full structure of the molecule that encodes genetic information. DNA was a double helix, a beautiful, elegant solution refined by evolution to carry instructions from one generation to another for all life on Earth. Of course, modern medicine is remarkable and, um, and it's getting more remarkable all the time. Um, we've all benefited from, from it in, in ways we can't guess. In my case, I, I had tuberculosis as a boy of um, nine and, you know, um, a few years before that would have been a slow death sentence. But, uh, you know, I was up and about about <laughs> a year later. So the modern sciences, I think, are, are very much emblematic of what many people associate with the West. But the modern sciences cannot tell us what are good uses of our knowledge and what are bad uses of our knowledge. We can use the modern sciences to save human lives in ways that were unimaginable to our ancestors. But we can also use the modern sciences to devise torture devices or to build weapons of mass destruction. So the sciences themselves are good in themselves, but they need guidance. And they need guidance from these other forms of reason, the fo reasoning of philosophy, the reasoning of law, the reasoning of what you might call political science, so that we make sure that this instrumental reason that is manifested through the modern sciences is put to good uses and promote human flourishing rather than bad uses and the destruction of human civilization. Science is a radical, destabilizing force, which may be why only the barbarian West, divided, ingenious, and committed to truth over stability, could unleash its fearful energies. And like the clocks that have been ticking in the West since the 13th century, modern science with its miraculous cures, its devastating insights, and its endless challenges, continues to advance. This clock is also in Cambridge. It was unveiled in 2008 by the late Stephen Hawking. Like its 14th century ancestors, this is a model of the universe, but a vastly improved one. These ripples reflect the pattern of explosions in a vacuum and symbolize the Big Bang. In the West, time and scientific models of the world are always moving forward, and our technology with them. One and a half million kilometers from Earth, the West's greatest telescope yet began sending back images in the summer of 2022. 
named for James Webb, who oversaw the mission to send the first men to the moon. It has already let us glimpse galaxies more than 13 billion light-years away. Albert Einstein here said that we ought not to be astonished that the Chinese sages didn't make the steps that led us to science. The astonishing thing is that the discovery was made at all. The results of that Western discovery continue to astonish us, improve our lives, and widen our horizons with no end in sight. <laughs>